uh, our topic before us today was to really look at two specific books, the Soul of Black Folks and the Gift of Black Folks. Uh, and we have had some very dynamic presentations there. What I'd like to remind you is that for our, for our president of the university, that his uh, being inspired as an undergraduate student to move and to write a manifesto was inspired by Du Bois's work. So as undergraduates, read Du Bois. Dr. Silver, provost of the university, points out that we should be scholars, that Du Bois was a scholar, educator, agitator, provocateur, and nation ruler. He reminds us that he puts our history in international context. And we also know locally that there is not one voice for the African American, for the black, for the Negro, that between Du Bois and Washington there was animosity. But with that, um, there should not be hushed criticism, uh, that there should be an honest dialogue. Uh, and if we just keep quiet about our something that agitates us, then that is not uh, moving us as a people forward. Dr. Williams Percy, Dean of Arts and Sciences, gave you all a lot of questions. Go do the research. As scholars, you should ask the questions, do the research, and write. And a family member. Mr. Carlin, thank you so much. Because there has to be someone keeping the history in everybody's family. You brought to us a synopsis of a dynamic man that we hope over this year's time that we'll come to know and grow in love a little closer and understand his impact uh, on us as a people and our future. What are we going to do uh, with this Negro problem? Uh, then and now, and in the future. From a personal standpoint, I would add that as an art historian, um, coming from a generation where I got to go to a school that was all white, and I was one of the few, I looked, my school pictures look like Du Bois's pictures. Um, and so it was a learning process to learn myself. That double consciousness was there, that I was having an education, but I wasn't necessarily living life yet. And so uh, taking on Du Bois's work and looking at it from a historian, from an art perspective, we see music, dance, Visual arts are very important. We saw women are very important from the turn of the century to now. So that he has given us a roadmap on which we can map our research, our education, and our future as, as educators. But what are we as an institution, as Clark Atlanta University, and I ask myself and challenge myself with this question, as the fourth generation Clarkite, what uh, roles and responsibilities do I have to the young people that come after me? So to teach them, educate them, let them read Du Bois, write about Du Bois, research, and not just have it be stagnant history, but how are you going to take that information and help the community to move forward, to help us, to help black people, and to help the world. Thank you. to facilitate the discussion. Uh, we do, as I mentioned, have a former student of Du Bois, and I would like to have a brief introduction of her as we uh, begin to think about how we dialogue about what it means to, again, um, not just recognize the name of Du Bois, but take this time uh, over the next year to recognize the purpose of, uh, of what higher education should be and the challenges that he left us.
Today we acknowledge Dr. DeVos as a master teacher, a tradition which a young girl, barely 21, in 1938, called to be bold, to pull, move away from Arkansas, and to come here to the center of black intellectual excellence, moved from Philander Smith to Atlanta University and became the student at Dr. DeVos. Evelyn, Dr. Evelyn Jenkins Carroll, Professor Emeritus Education from Spelman College, came and was here to witness that life and tell us great stories, including her uh, boldness to accept a dare for 10 cents that she would not go over and sit with Dr. Du Bois for dinner because he had a tradition of sitting alone. So for the bet of 10 cents, she dared. <laughs> I wish Dr. Ellen Davis Carroll to stand because I want you to appreciate that the boldness comes in this packet, not quite five feet tall. <laughs> answer all of your questions, and I'm sure neither did everyone else. Yes. Yes, sir.
collapsed was 1947, but Ghana isn't independent into the year that I was born, which is 1957. And so what you, what you see in that intervening time from a right around 1898 all the way up into Ghana's independence in 1957 is a lot of work being done across nations with people like Kwame Nkrumah, with people like Yomo Kenyatta, who are trying as best they can to get the people within their countries to agitate for independence, as well as to get the colonials to say, we are going to let go of what was, of course, an investment. They were invested financially in these countries. They were not necessarily invested in the people. And so it was the people who were looking for independence, and it was the people who demanded that. And so in terms of the details behind what was going on with the Pan-African Congresses, I would turn to some of the, the libraries of Harvard and University of Massachusetts at Amherst to do the study that I think that you're talking about, which I think is very much needed. I don't know that we have really paid a lot of attention to what the Pan-African Congresses did, other than to say the result is an independent Africa. If I may as well, um, I have not been to Ghana, but would love to go to Ghana. I know that there are students and faculty and administrators and administrators who have gone to Ghana, as well as those who are from Africa. So I would I would uh, want to point out that Dr. Charmaine Pedersen is stand up so they can see you are um, is assisting the Department of History and working with uh, Dr. Brown in international studies in um, creating a seven-day study abroad trip to Ghana as part of this year-long study. So in late July or early August, we're getting the dates, uh, we're negotiating uh, an opportunity for us to go. In addition, um, with the magic of Skype, it, uh, I will definitely extend a, 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 an invitation to those who are in Ghana to join us at the 2013 conference for those who can't in person so we can discuss not only the historic Pan-African uh, uh, movements that started in 1900 in London, London, and I must mention Anna Julia Cooper, who was an African-American woman there, who was the black woman speaker, invited speaker, a contemporary of Du Bois we don't always speak of. But we can also look uh, in the past at Pan-African movements, but how we can continue to connect. Because from what I hear, what's happening in Ghana, there's so much good work that needs to be done, uh, restoration, reclamation work that needs to be done um, with the Du Bois site in Ghana as well. And so, again, this is simply um, problem-solving research. How can we continue to make these strategic connections, but also reclaim internationally uh, what we're doing? Uh, I will see to the young lady here. I'm a Clark Atlanta. My name is Akira Bradley. First of all, I'm a Clark Atlanta student. I'm a freshman. They're on behalf of me and some of the other Clark students that are probably have to go to class. I just want to say that it was a pleasure listening to you. And I heard about you from my teacher. I'm an early childhood education major. And he told me to come here. I want to say that it was a pleasure listening to you and hearing of the boy and his legacy and your grandfather. And I just want to let you know that thank you for coming, first of all, and that I plan on following in his great legacy and the movement of us as a people and the whole world in that greatness. So thank you. And that's a first year student, what y'all seniors got. I'm just saying. This, this, this is about, this is about that spirit. This is about that spirit. And we want to help you get to that next level, to get to fill our shoes and continue that legacy. We're here for you. I thank you very much for that, and I just want you to know that I've made a commitment to Atlanta University, to Clark Atlanta University, to be here uh, on and off as much as I can to celebrate this next year. I will definitely be back with my friends who uh, were mentioned earlier with Alelia Bundles and Michelle Duster and Charlie and Drew Jarvis to uh, close this out. But I have made a commitment to President Brown and to Dr. Evans and to Dr. Silver and Dr. Kirsty, I'm Williams Kirsty, I'm sorry. And I just want to make sure that the faculty here and the staff here and the students here know that I'm available to answer questions and to talk about Grandpa. It's just what I like to do. I don't like to stand up in front of stages all, on stages all the time and in front of microphones, but I do uh, like to, to talk about him and to get people's sense of who he is. Yes. My name is Gordon Dowers, and I'm a um, MFA.
welcome to the National Social Work Institute um, and our social work program here at Cross Atlanta. And my question is to President Brown, who said that um, the readings of uh, Dr. DeVore is not uh, historic, that it speaks to our present issues and dilemmas, and um, that we should um, identify the problems that existed and still exist and find out what we should do. And so um, my question is, how, how do you think that the souls of black folk, because when I read that, I identified in so many ways how our problems are still existing, these same problems. How do, how do you think that it speaks to um, the feminization of poverty and the ageist policy? You know, and in might of uh, 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 the context of people living so much longer, particularly black women who live to uh, so much longer than uh, African American men, and and then we end up so poor and destitute and abject poverty. The here's the reality I think we have to face, and, and uh, I talked about this in a presentation um, about. Du Bois's last period here in his interaction with Clement um, a couple of years ago. The problem that we have always encountered as a people is our ability to begin and to complete a thrust. So both of a, a, a primary issue in both of Du Bois' times here at Atlanta University was about the issue of scholarship that I mentioned before. Scholarship by, for, and about black people, but our capacity to own it and control it and to utilize it for the purposes of developing the black world internationally. So in his first time, it was the Encyclopedia Africana which he was not able to get fully funded, did not bring to fruition. The issue came back up again at several points in his life. And so part of why John Hope asked him to come back, and initially the boys did not want to come back because of his relationship with the NAACP. Now he was already in deep battle uh, in that reign, but uh, what John Hope conceptual which goes back to their long-term relationship. They were together uh, at the Niagara Movement uh, and had been long-time friends and colleagues, was let's try again to make this thing happen. Mm -hmm. That was the time period when John Hope was trying to pull all of the institutions in Atlanta together to make one comprehensive conglomerate of the full array of institutional types that you need to move a nation forward. That was when he was bringing Clark College as it failed in another part of time, trying to be the lead Methodist University, and said, if you come, you complete a part of the puzzle, but you got to decide that you're going to be a comprehensive co-educational, selective admissions, undergraduate institution. You'll be a college, not a university. That then enables Atlanta University to pursue graduate studies and become this focal point of research. So all of this was happening. Morris Brown, uh, the building of the Joint Library, which was Trevor Arnett, um, the uh, location of Clark College across what is now J.P. Brawley, built them their first three buildings. Uh, in the plans were a medical school and a law school. So, as one example of how we don't get it done, during Du Bois' second time, as they began this process, and he was drawing in all of the presidents of the black land grant colleges in a collaborative to talk about how we build scholars and scholarship. And he even had pulled in Hampton, Fisk and Howard. So he had this second meeting of all these folks. And everyone had committed to go back to their institutions, build new curricula that created scholars, follow them here, begin to build that scholarship. John Hope dies. Mm -hmm. Okay? 
So here he is, and I'm going to just tell the short story because this is one of the deepest stories in the whole deal. Florence Reed, one of the last white presidents of Spelman, is in this conglomerate, and they have a joint board, and Florence Reed is the treasurer of the joint board. Florence Reed, after John Hope died, wanted to do what John Hope did. John Hope was simultaneously president of Morehouse and Atlanta University. She wanted to be president of Spelman and Atlanta University. The joint board made a different decision. That's when Clement arrived. Mm -hmm. So Florence, Reed, and Clement are fighting each other. Du Bois is picking at everybody. <laughs> he's, just, he's just digging at everybody. He's saying crazy stuff about Florence Reed, in spite of the fact that he knows she's got purse strings. He's jacking up Clement every chance he gets uh, over all kinds of things. The food in the cafeteria, the behavior of the Morehouse men in the cafeteria, the fact that Florence Reed doesn't like black folks. Uh, in fact, the seminal statement, the one that I think kind of got Florence Reed to say, okay, I got to do something here. He said publicly, Florence Reed does not care much about black people. Oh my God. Or the rest of humanity for that <laughs> Okay, so this so here we have this combination of Du Bois' flaw, the failure of the institutions to build the kind of succession that can begin and carry forward a consistent thrust of activity. Clement comes in, a very young, untested president. He's got to wrestle Florence Reed, he's got to wrestle Du Bois. He understands what Hope was trying to do, but he can't do it. So that is when Du Bois is happily working in his office because he's setting up the final conference. This is where it all comes into play, and we finally get this done. We become the home of scholarship and buying about black folk forever. It's about to go down. He gets a letter. It's his letter of retirement. He's gone. Now, I said before, Clement understood Hope's plan. Because after that, into Horace Mann Bond to push the issues in education, into Whitney M. Young Jr. to push the social work issues. Okay, so he's trying to carry it out, but you can almost see his thinking. I can't do this with Du Bois. If I don't do something about Du Bois or let something happen to Du Bois, none of this will ever happen. What a dilemma. <laughs> you, know, you can almost see him saying, why me? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay? So part of our issue here and why we don't get, it, get something all the way done is these are the kinds of things that happen. And we don't build our enterprises in a way that allows them to continue past our own existence. Okay? So once you say to yourself, I'm starting this thing, and it's not about me, it's bigger than me, in fact, it's bigger than all of us, and it will change life forever on planet Earth, now your next question is, how do I get it to survive whatever happens to me? So that's why these issues never get fully played out. That's why we can't do a complete transformation of America. That's why even at the end of each world war, Du Bois was at those peace conferences because he understood that one of the big issues in all the post-war conferences was the division of Africa among Europeans. He understood that. And so he was always there trying to modify that issue, but he was 90% alone. He had allies that came and went. He had allies that sometimes thought that he was too much the big man and they wanted to be the big man. And we've all seen this phenomenon in our lives. Okay. Uh, so you put all those things together. His flaws, situations, lack of resources, uh, completely intractable issues. And some allies who were at some points, because of what they were doing, were faced with the prospect of the cessation of income if they continued. 
And so that's why all of this is still in front of us. And that's why one of the things that we talked about yesterday was our need to understand that while we can't fix the past, the future scholarship by, about, and for people of color has to at some point find a way to be claimed and controlled by us. Now, I'm not attacking UMass Amherst. I had a tremendous set of experiences there, and I'm glad that stuff is there. If it had not been there, I would not know what I know. I'm not attacking Yale. Again, as I told you, I spent three days in the basement of Yale University Library with the Langston Hughes papers and Arnold Bontops. That's a beautiful thing. I sure wish it could have been here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, that's how the look. Thank President Brown so much because in President Brown, Provo Silver, and Dean Williams Kirksey, the history department in working with all of the other departments has uh, an ally. I mean, to have administration agree on something, you know, without infighting is as difficult as having the faculty uh, agree on something or the students agree on something. And if we can all pull together Harambe and agree that the answers to the questions you seek are at the tip of your pen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That why we, there's a culture change that is happening, I think, but that desperately needs to happen at this institution where we're not fighting students to try to convince them that they need to learn how to read and write. Or that faculty need to, because some of the most knowledgeable people are on this campus, but if you don't write it, we won't know it. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and then we'll have a final question for this gentleman. George Levering Lewis writes extensively. Writes extensively. And I'm writing a piece about Dr. Carroll that says master teachers produce master teachers who produce master teachers. Yes. We have actually worked with grandma. But as I sit here talking with Dr. Carroll, she said to me that George Levering Lewis' mother was her teacher. Really? And his father was the principal of her school. Interesting. <laughs> I mean, I'm saying this is a fascinating piece of history just from sitting here talking about it. Exactly. I, I always find that there is no such thing as coincidence. Mm -hmm. So I don't believe that that's a coincidence. I think that you have, as students, great students because you were a great teacher, and you have, as a great teacher, because you had great teachers before you. Yes, ma'am, please. <laughs>
I recognize that I was a student something before. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. I think people ask me all the time, why do I come and do these kinds of things? Why do I say yes to these kinds of events? And it's because of things like that. Because people come and they say to me the way they've heard about Grandpa and the things that he's meant to them. Quick question, I'm probably saying that you have a question. Had it not been for the passport incident, do you think you would have remained in Ghana? There is, that's a, a big question. There are a lot of uh, pieces of information that go into that. There were some, there's some question as to whether or not he would have gone if they were not contemplating taking his passport again. And there were some questions about whether he would have come back from Ghana if in fact they had allowed him to come back to the United States. There, at least from what I've heard and read, there is a sense that he would have come back from Ghana to the United States. There were some interesting things here that were going on that he wanted to follow up on and complete and do. And so I had the sense that he would have come back to the United States if he had been given the opportunity. But at the same time, I also know that he was tired of being persecuted. When he got to Ghana, they treated him like a king. Um, when he got to Russia, they treated him like a king. When he got to China, they treated him like a king. And so we all, all African Americans who left the United States and went to Europe and spent time there experienced the exact same thing. Whether you were Josephine Baker or um, Hampton or you were um, Langston Hughes or whoever you were, you went to Europe and they treated you so differently. So I, I can just suppose that he would have liked to have come back to the United States and done a couple more things, but History says no. If I can have a, the last word, do you want to say something no. else? Do I get <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it like that. See? Now here we go. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you to you. So you've got to stay up and come back. <laughs> It doesn't happen unless someone has an idea, unless someone has a vision. We've been talking about my great-grandfather's ideas and about his vision. What you have here in Dr. Stephanie Evans is vision. There's a saying, and I don't know who said it, and one of these days someone will tell me if I keep repeating it off the night. The saying goes, the world needs dreamers, and the world needs doers. But most of all, the world needs dreamers that do. Right. A dreamer that does standing here for you. All right. I wish I could be you. Mm. I do. I wish I could stay here and learn from all of the people that you have here, including Dr. Evans. I can't. I'll come back and visit. Lucky you. Upstairs to continue this discussion through next year and beyond. Peace be with you, as our provost says.